All right, so just to get started here, um, are there uh, any questions from last time? Anything about procedures or policies? Uh, I, I think the last time I checked all, but I think four students had completed the unit zero assignments. So looks like most everybody got the, the course unlocked. If you have any trouble with that, then uh, let me know. And, um, you know, but it, it looks like most people got it unlocked. Fine. If, um, if you're one of those four students, make sure you go to unit zero, the module unit zero. There's three little kind of syllabus quiz type assignments. Complete those. If you happen to miss one, you can take it again uh, as many times as you want. And once you get 100% on all three, then it'll unlock the rest of the course. One of those counts as a lab. So, and the other counts as uh, lecture attendance. Okay. All right. So let me recenter on PowerPoint here. I think. No, let's do that. Good. All right. Okay. So um, reminders here. That's a reminder. All right, so reminders here, um, ICA A2 is on Canvas. It's available, it's due before Thursday. It's a two question Canvas activity. Um, it's um, just an introductory one. Um, it, um, this is one because it's only two questions. When you start it, you only have 15 minutes to complete it, uh, but it's really easy points. Um, there are, I think, I don't know, something like 12 Canvas activities and you get the drop. Uh, like, I don't know, seven of them or something like that. There's a really uh, healthy drop policy on Canvas activities, but don't leave this as one of your drops. It's just this, you know, quick two question Canvas activity. It's uh, one kind of content related question related to content in this lecture and one question related to kind of course policy. Lab one is technically this week, Wednesday. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, the lecture is available online. You can start it whenever you'd like. You can go to your lecture or your lab session to get help from the TA, that's perfectly fine if you want to do that. But if you don't feel like you need help with it, or you just like to, you know, get the help in office hours or something like that, then uh, you don't have to do that. So um, all the labs are already available. You can complete them as you'd like. They're going to be due during weeks that are related to their content. So lab one is due to this week or is related to this week's content, uh, and it's you know I guess technically due Sunday, uh, but. Um, but you can start them whenever you'd like. Um, and for those who want to work ahead, the next I, all the ICAs are available, um, except for two that have to that are sort of re rely on you finishing one ICA first. And um, and then the, the next two homeworks are updated and available. And so homework B1, which will be a homework that's not formally assigned until next week, until Tuesday of next week. And then you have something like 10 days to complete it. Um, that's already available in case you'd like to start on that. So that's all of moving forward. Any questions about that? Everything pretty clear? Okay, questions in the chat? No? All right. Okay, so that was more than I wanted. Interesting. So, um, all right, I guess I'm gonna have to do this old, the old fashioned way here. All right, so uh, today we're, uh, you know, this week's lectures are gonna be introduction to modeling, introduction to simulation modeling. So today modeling, um, just wanna start with, um, I mean, I generally, I, I'm not in, into the whole like introduce the professor sort of thing, but this kind of ties into it. So my background is, uh, you know, back when I was very young, I worked in software engineering and telecommunications, things like that. And this was back in a time where nobody was working in then. So you did this kind of, uh, the only people who were working in this were sort of very young. And so I was in that kind of group. So then, then I went on after kind of a software engineering career to go into my bachelor's in electrical engineering, did a lot of things with analog electronics, robotics, control theory, got interested in bio-inspiration, bio-inspired algorithms, you know, postdoc in uh, then in computer science and then a postdoc in biology. So then I learned to work in a wet lab. And so my lab is I think the only lab in sky that has a wet lab in it. So, cause I combine a lot of different disciplines from engineering and sciences and all those sorts of things. So it was kind of a circuitous route here where 
industrial engineering doesn't actually show up um, anywhere formally in my background. And so it may not be the most traditional path to industrial engineering, but it's, it's my claim that this sort of actually all set me up for this sort of work because my claim that industrial engineering is sort of a mixture of all of these types of things. And so, um, so with that, um, I'd like to sort of ask you guys, your 400 level class in IE, what do you think? What is industrial engineering? Does anybody have any ideas? Also in the chat would be fine. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the response here was I call it common sense engineering. Could you explain what you mean by that? Someone says, oh, we've always done it this way, but it doesn't make any sense. So you just do a common sense change, like labeling racks or something like that. And it uh, increases efficiency pretty, pretty heavily. All right, what, what I like about that answer, so you mentioned that, that um, common sense engineering, it sounds like people have sort of their pet theories for how things are supposed to run and they always kind of run that way. And you go in and you find out that, well, it turns out that you've done it this particular way and um, and there's some indication from us kind of looking at the data that maybe things should be done a different way. So if we do things a slightly different way, then it turns out we get an operational improvement. And so it's unique in that there is no like industrial engineering sort of textbook, like this is how the world always works. It's not like, you know, a chemistry where you know that, you know, this redox reaction always has, when you have these inputs, you have these outputs. You know, there's, there's much more of a, of, you said common sense. So you're bringing in a lot of your personal knowledge about these systems, not necessarily about the natural world and using that to your advantage. Anybody else have any other things? That, that, yeah. So optimization comes up a lot. So, so making processes better. So not necessarily building the process, but building the better process. I think, I think that's also kind of a good thing. Anybody else have anything else that they've kind of picked up along the way? in your IE curriculum or otherwise, or internships, et cetera. Yeah. Efficiency, so similar sort of thing that you're not necessarily um, developing the first system, but you're taking that system and saying, what's wrong with this system? How can we make it better? Um, so that it does the same thing, but does it with a lot less energy, with a lot less water, with a lot less manpower, et cetera. That's right, yeah, yeah. Um, so money is an interesting thing to put in there. So he's saying that that's another thing that you build a process and then you can say um, for every widget that, uh, that makes us $2 in profit, um, you know, if we make these changes, maybe we can get $3 in profit because of efficiency, for example. And so the money becomes very explicit. Uh, you know, you might, I, I mean, I would argue that money is always important to engineers, that, you know, that the physicist is the one who builds the device that operates once and operates for a week for an experiment and then fails. And the engineer in general is the one who says, I can't just build the thing to last for a week. I gotta build something that has to, where a million of them have to be manufactured and 95% of those have to last for at least five years and they all have to sell for under a particular amount, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so money I think is important for all of engineering but it is particularly important in industrial engineering because it's one of these factors that we can optimize. So, so yeah, these all things I think do kind of boil into this kind of soup that I'm, I'm kind of picturing here. So that's good. Well, let's, so, you know, let's move forward. So like what's, so if let's more broadly, what's the difference between science in general and engineering? So we just listed things that we view are kind of linked to industrial engineering. So what's the difference between science and engineering? I already kind of contrasted physics and all that, yeah. So observation versus creation. So the, the comment here was that science is observation, observing the natural world and making inferences from it, whereas engineering is creating something new in the world. So I like that's kind of an interesting. Anybody else have any other contrast? Um, yeah. So, that, so the comment there was science is the knowledge of the thing and engineering is the application of the knowledge of the thing. I think that's kind of the other side of that same coin is that science is gathering knowledge from the observations of the world, putting that up there into the literature 
And then an engineer can come by and say, huh, that's interesting. That particular quantum mechanical effect, that could be useful. I could build a doorbell out of that or something like that. You know, that scientist who's working in the, the, the quantum laboratory is probably not thinking about doorbells. But you guys are out there thinking, wow, there is a, I could be an entrepreneur here. I could, you know, this is a new effect that I could leverage in this particular way. I mean, the people that, that you know, I mean, if you think about the different evolutions of display technology, you know, cathode ray tubes, you know, the big glass tubes that we don't use anymore. I mean, that's crazy that the idea that you shoot electrons through a narrow passageway and you use magnets to, to drive them to different spots on a piece of glass it's coated with a phosphorus that, that will glow whenever that electron hits it. Like, that's just nuts. You know, that is, but that is saying I've leveraged electricity, magnetism, uh, you know, quantum effects because of the light, you know, there's all of these different things that I'm putting together in, um, in order to build something new. Um, and then there was a comment in the chat, the optimization of current processes. So that, that was for the IE one. And that also, yeah, that fits in that optimization. So I like this kind of thread that we're going through here. Um, and the way I, uh, you know, this is a definition that I pulled up for science that out of, I think, Merriam-Webster. And it, and it sort of follows from your comment back there, such knowledge or such a system of knowledge concerned with the physical world and its phenomena. So that's what we're defining as science. So a scientist grows the body of knowledge about the natural world by making inferences gathered in experiments. So the scientist is going out there doing experiments. So a scientist says, I think the world works this way. I am going to test my hypothesis. It's a hypothesis, right? So it's not a theory. Hypo is like not quite, it's under, right? Hypothesis is so it's not quite a theory. So it's not quite a theory because I haven't tested it yet. So I'm going to go out and test it and I'm going to run an experiment. And if my hypothesis is correct, the experiment will come out this way. If it doesn't, my hypothesis is wrong, which is a lot like the example from the internship uh, question mentioned over here. You know, so in that case, I had this system. I didn't quite know how it worked, but it seems like them doing it this way wasn't quite right for this. So we're going to go and do that experiment. So already this is getting a little interesting here because um, you know the, the electrical engineer, the chemical engineer might not be doing these same types of experiments, but I claim as the industrial engineer will. So in engineering, this again goes back to the comment about application, the application, and this is again Merriam-Webster, application of science and mathematics by which the properties of matter and the sources of energy in nature are made useful to people. So it's the made useful to people which is kind of an important thing here. So engineering is about people, is about taking knowledge that has been inferred by a whole community of people out there interested in the natural, the physical world, and then turning that into something useful. So an engineer is cons a consumer of science, of scientific knowledge. The engineer uses knowledge about the natural world to construct new things. So construction of new things, I was brought up here as well, that are useful. And that might be in terms of function, accessibility, longevity, the economics of it also go into that. You know, things are useful to people because they can go out and buy them and make use of them. You know, uh, the, the one-off, you, know, you, know, you know, you can send Jeff Bezos into space and, you know, in, in some ways that's kind of exciting, right? But, you know, it's not really exciting until it becomes something that the non-Jeff Bezos of the world could do. But engineers are working on that, right? Because it's that, that will make it useful to people. So, um, but that consumer knowledge is what I want to focus on here. So like a chemical engineer, chemi, they are going to depend upon knowledge from chemistry, right? You have chemistry on one side, and then on the other side here, you've got stuff you build um, from uh, this, uh, from your chemistry. So uh, you've got soaps and toothpaste and things like that. These are all things that the chemist didn't dream up necessarily, but the engineer saw them, said, hmm, I can make use of that. I'm not learning anything about the natural world, but I'm learning new ways I can put things together using what they gave me from the natural world. So, um, the, you know, the chemist depends on that. The electrical engineer, you know, studies, you know, Maxwell's laws. So an electrical engineer, you know, there's four Maxwell's laws, about four years for engineering, you learn one per year. And so you end up learning all of Maxwell's laws. And then hopefully you build game controllers or CPUs or light bulbs. 
You know, these are all things that, um, that these wouldn't be bundled into science, but you're consuming. These are all based off of stuff that you could look up in a physics book, an electromagnetics book. But when we think about industrial engineering under this template, then it makes me wonder, what the heck is the science that industrial engineering is drawing from? Because when you talk about chemical engineering, it's obvious, it's chemistry. You look into a chemistry book, you find cool properties, you build cool things, you build a thermos that has certain thermodynamic properties, whatever. Electrical engineering, you know, you look at an electricity and magnetism book, you know, a physics book, you learn about all that stuff. What, what do you learn there? You mentioned your internship. You had to solve problems for which there was no chemistry book that you could just look into and say, hmm, what's the, you know, the melting point of this particular thing that, and, and how could I make use of that? So, so that's something that um, is a question I want you sort of to think about there. And when, when you think about it, you have to sort of then think about, well, what sorts of systems do we build? Well, we build systems that are involved in industry and industry involves things like combinations of people and technology. So I hear people and I know how people use things, how people work. Well, that kind of reminds me of psychology. Maybe psychology is important to industrial engineering. <clears throat> psychology is a science of the study of the human mind and its functions, especially those affecting behavior in a context. Because I could see how that would be useful to an industrial engineer coming up with um, you know, where do I put the cashiers in a particular uh, grocery store? Or, um, you know, how do I design uh, particular highway systems? You know, thinking about how people are going to drive on them. Maybe psychology is important. And then you think about it and like, well, I'm not just interested in one person. I'm interested in a group of people together. How do people work together? How are people as a whole going to come into this room and assort in these seats? How are people going to go into that grocery store and assort throughout the grocery store? How can I optimize the layout of these things, keeping in mind that these people are not only going to be interacting with the technology that I've developed, but also with each other. That sounds like social psychology. The branch of psychology deals with social interactions, including origins and their effects on the individual. You see, that's fine. But just if I were to just brush up on my social psychology, I could still build things that were not implementable, that were too costly, that were illegal. And so I might have to bring in law, ergonomics, economics. I have to bring in all of these sorts of things in order to build industrial systems realistically. So there is no one science that is responsible for industrial engineering. And so you then have to ask, well, then who is responsible for gathering the knowledge that makes these connections? And going back to the internship example, it's you, the industrial engineer. We have to build knowledge by doing experiments in our own systems. We have to be both the scientist and the engineer um, in order to do this. So there's gonna be these complex mixtures of people and technology. Yeah, at the base of it all, physics is there, chemistry is there, biology is there, psychology, et cetera, all of that is there. But the mixture of that, the complex system, that mixes all of those things, which can be understood at a small scale using an individual science, we have to think about for at a large scale when you put all that stuff together. And there is no science that already does that. And so we fill in that vacuum. So industrial and systems engineering is the overlap between science and engineering. Yes, it is engineering, designing new processes for how technology and humans interact, making systems more efficient, but unlike the other engineers out there who can just lean on the crutch of the scientists that are down the hall, we don't have that crutch. We don't have those scientists. So we have to be the ones who are designing experiments, developing models and making inferences about the validity of models. We have to go out and say, I think it's a terrible idea for you to put that cashier next to that cashier. So in all of the a million stores that you have across the United States, in 10% of them, I want you to move those cashiers and test it out and then see what the performance difference is after you move those. And then if you do get a performance improvement, implement it across all million stores. You just did an experiment. You just tested the hypothesis. You did the science that the scientists aren't doing for you. That's what we do as industrial and systems engineers, both the science and the engineering. 
and it requires developing models. In that particular case, the 10% of the stores that you experimented on by moving the cashiers around, those are a model of all of the stores. And so by experimenting with the model, then you're able to make an inference about the whole population, all of the stores. And then by making that inference, you can then decide to then say, well, my model um, uh, implied that this good result would happen. So now I can deploy it on the whole population. So that's kind of what, uh, what I mean by it's both science and engineering. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Now I'm going through all this sort of philosophical stuff because I want to get us to whatever the heck a model is. So that we're all on board with a model and what a model does not have to be. Because a lot of people criticize models because they aren't perfect. And perfection is not what we seek in a model. We do not optimize a model for its accuracy. So we'll get to that in a second. So what are models? So um, these are fashion models. Why do we call them fashion models? What is their function? Say it again. Oh. Show off designer clothes is the question here. They are modeling fashion. They're showing it off. Well, why is it useful to put clothes on these people? Why can't we just look at it in a catalog and just see it or, or laying out on a table? Yeah. It, it attempts to represent how they function in the real world. The, I don't look a lot like this guy here. I mean, the amount of product in this guy's hair is probably more than I put in my hair in a week, especially, you know, pandemic wise. But, um, but he has got shoulders and I've got shoulders and he's got arms and I've got arms. He's got legs and I've got legs. He um, is more svelte than I am to say the least, but uh, he is um, a lot better representation of a human form than a hanger. So this helps me answer a what if question. What if I were to buy these clothes and put them on me? And I'd say, you know, I might look a little bit like this. Or, you know, likewise, the same thing with the dress. You know, the dress um, here looks a lot different on her. Um, I mean, just given, I mean, look at I mean, the fact that the, you know, there's so much of this picture that's not the dress that needs to be appreciated in order to understand how the dress will look that you won't get on a hanger or folded up on a table. And so that's what they're attempting to do. But the interesting thing here is all of the degrees of freedom that they will make use of to convince you that these clothes look better than they do. They don't choose any random person to put in, in these clothes. They say, well, we have the degrees of freedom, so why don't we choose people that fit some norm of attractiveness? Why don't we take pictures of them until they're in positions that we've shown sell more clothes? Notice that both of them, for whatever reason, are tilted this way. I don't know why they're tilted that way, but they're both tilted that way. And I stitched this thing together from two different images that I found, basically the same position. I have a feeling that someone out there figured out that if you have this sort of asymmetry in the way people pose in these clothes, it somehow makes the clothes, maybe it, it takes away um, certain things that if they were to stand upright, you would maybe notice, you know, that, oh, I don't actually like the length of that or whatever, but that maybe it adds just enough asymmetry that for some reason it masks certain things. And so we are going to build models and we are going to also have degrees of freedom that we will be free to choose. And we may not even realize when we're doing it, but we can accidentally set our models up to look a lot better than they actually do. And that's exactly what they do here. So, um, so that's one reason why we call them fashion models. But in principle though, they're answering a what if question. What if I were to put on these clothes? This, as my biologist friends would tell me, is called an animal model. It is a mouse that is used in a laboratory. Why is it called an animal model? Why, what makes this a model? Anybody? 
So I'm not talking about like a mathematical model of the animal. I'm talking about the animal itself is a model. Yeah. So I hear similar body functions to a human, um, but shorter lifespan. So um, why is the shorter lifespan helpful? Okay, so that's an interesting point there. So there are features of this. So he's saying that because it has a shorter lifespan that perhaps you could study the effect of maybe a behavioral routine, exercise, or a drug on the whole life of the animal. And it's similar enough to a human that if you saw a difference between a control group and a treatment group, you might be able to infer that that difference would be similar in humans. So it is answering a what if question of what if we were to apply that treatment to a human, but it allows us to do it in a system that might be more convenient. It might be more ethically sound according to our norms here that you know people would rather experiment on an animal than a human first or something like that. Um, so it again, it's this idea is it's answering a what if question. So we view it as a model because it helps us to infer how things might be if we were to go and make an intervention in the real world in a system of interest to us. We might not be interested in mice, but we might use mice because they are a good stand-in. They are better than the hanger in the case of the fashion model than the human model. So they're not perfect, but they are a good first, second, third step. This is the Bohr model of an atom. You know, it's called a model of an atom. You know, that you've got this, um, this nucleus surrounded by these concentric circles that are the orbits of these electrons. For a long time, this was a very well performing model of how matter works. Um, it, it did a lot, you know? So, um, so this, this was, it, it still is a model of matter, but Bohr even noticed that there were some empirical observations that he found that wouldn't quite didn't quite fit this model. The model didn't quite make the predictions just right enough or not just precise enough. There were errors. And so Bohr said, well, what if they're not actually circles? He has an alternative model, an ellipsoid model of the atom, where at different energy levels, you actually get different shapes of these electrons as they're going around the nucleus. And this model of the atom maybe did a little bit better for certain contexts, but still wasn't perfect. And so, of course, today, um, we have very different models of the atom. We still teach this, maybe in high school, earlier than that. But eventually, when you get to college-level physics and chemistry, then you learn about MO bond theory, you know, molecular orbitals and things like that, where now electrons are clouds that just exist in some probabilistic density around the nucleus. We don't view them as orbiting like planets around the sun anymore. And this different model of electron position has been very, has been phenomenal in improving our abilities to predict what happens in experiments with matter. But it's still just a model. And then on the flip side of things, for those who are more interested in the inside of the atom, the inside of the nucleus, there's another electron model that has to do with the interactions, again, inside that nucleus, what holds those nuclei together. These are all models of electrons. These, this half of the screen on the, on the right-hand side of the screen answers one set of questions. On the left-hand side of the screen answers a different set of questions, um, but they're all use this electron thing as a mathematical tool to make predictions. And up until this point, you may have, um, because you've never sort of taken a class maybe that has been so philosophical about models as we are here, um, you might have just been told that electrons exist. But from my perspective, and I hope maybe some of your perspectives, but at least at least you'll think about this this way, electrons do not exist. Electrons are models. They're useful at making predictions. Now you might say that I'm taking this too far, of course they exist. Uh, Mr. Jones from fifth grade told you that they exist. 
And that's fine if you want to make, take that epistemological stance, but there could be an enterprising young graduate student down you know, the, the way from here, about a block away, who's up in her lab doing an experiment right now, showing that her toy model that of matter that doesn't use electrons actually makes much more precise predictions of the fine structure constant of the universe or something like that than any of these models. And once her model gets published, then the day after that, electrons will cease to exist and they will just be a convenient abstraction that we all believed in once upon a time, but now we believe in whatever the thing that she came up with was. So the power of the prediction is what determines how dominant the models are, but at not at any one time should we ever think that the models exist. The models are useful and we don't care whether they exist. We don't care how realistic they are. This goes with uh, Newtonian mechanics too. Newton, you know, Newtonian mechanics is enormously useful. You know, most of, of all of the mechanical engineering that you hear about until you get into really weird stuff is based off of all Newtonian mechanics. But of course we know now that it's all wrong, that, that, that you, they're relativistic mechanics that take much better into account the effects of say gravity and so on. But, um, it's really a pain to make use of relativistic mechanics. And so we use Newtonian mechanics. So it's not that, if you could say, well, is relativistic mechanics right? Well, I'd say no, it just makes more precise predictions. You know, it's maybe a better model in terms of its predictive ability, but it is not better in its utility. We resort to relativistic mechanics when we have to, but whenever we can, we use F equals MA because that just is a heck of a lot easier to use and far more useful. You can fly an airplane from here all around the world on F equals MA, not ever having to worry about this stuff down here. So it's not about how accurate things are, it's about how useful they are. And so I hope you've heard this quote before, um, probably from some other faculty, even in IE, famous statistician, George Box, wrote essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. Box was not attacking models. Box was instructing us for how we select models. The practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? Newtonian mechanics is wrong, but it is not wrong enough to not be useful. You know, so electrons, we don't know if they're right or wrong, but they are damn useful. So we keep using them. So it's not about how right they are. You should never seek to say, is my model right? Is my model accounting for everything? It's how predictive is your model? How useful is your model? So for such a model, there's no need to ask the question, is the model true? If true is to be the whole truth, we'll always say no. You will never find a model that is 100% true. It will always leave something out, make a wrong assumption, et cetera, et cetera. The only question of interest to you, the modeler, the statistician, is, is the model illuminating and useful? Did you learn something about it? When you came up with that plum pudding model of the electro or of the atom, did it get you farther in your day than you did before the plum pudding model? And if it did, based on everything else that's out there, that is a useful model. Go ahead and use that. Now you come up with the next model and I might get rid of your plum pudding model. Now there's a more useful model, but the, it's not, are we getting closer and closer to reality? It's, are we getting more and more useful? We build useful models, even if they're leaving some things out. So this is a fortune cookie I got once. Do not seek to find the answer so much as to, answer, to understand the question better. That's really what we do as we're building models here. You guys are always gonna be tempted when you start building models to wanna pack in everything into your simulation model because you know that sometimes these corner cases happen. But then you have to ask yourself, do I really wanna build a whole model around corner cases? Or is there something more fundamental that I can get to if I leave those corner cases out? You know, so that's really what we're saying here. Uh, I wanna understand the question better, understand the research direction better. I don't necessarily want to just find the, the answer, the answer, because I'm never gonna find the answer, but I'm going to chip away at the question. All right, so that's what I'm trying to provide you here. If you ask me, like if on a midterm or whatever, if I said, what is the simplest definition of whatever the heck a model is? 
models answer what if questions. That's my definition of a model. And so models could be anything. They could be pieces of paper, they could be physical objects, they could be computer simulations, they could be math, they could be fashion models, they could be animals. Anything that helps us answer a what if question is a model. And if you think about it, everything could be a model, it's just how you use that model. All right, any questions about that? Is that distinction clear? Even in the chat, if anybody has any questions, happy to take those. All right. All right, so um, let's just try one of these attendance exercises out for today. So um, those of you online, um, if I can manage to navigate to the chat, I can put this URL in the chat but I don't want to spend too much time fumbling. Oh, there's the mouse. All right, well, I'm not going to be able to get to it. So those of you online, you can manually type this in. Um, those of you here can manually type this in or scan that QR code. Um, it should bring you to a Google form. You'll have to log in with your ASU ID. If for some reason you're having trouble doing that right now, you're going to have 24 hours after this to do this. The question that I'm going to answer here or ask here is an easy one. And it's what is the question that models answer most generally? So what's the magic question that I use to define a model? What does a model do? So basically in question one, just put that up there as your answer and then leave it. Don't hit submit. Just put that up there as your top answer. And we might ask a couple more of these and at the end of the class, I'll tell you when to hit submit and then that's how you get your attendance credit. All right. Pretty clear, everybody online, no notes there. All right. All right, I'll move along here, making sure nobody seems to be stressed about that. All right, so types of models. Um, so uh, you're, we talk about statistical models. So st whenever I refer to a statistical model, I'm referring to a model that infers relationships from data. So stats or inferential statistics starts with designing an experiment to take data. And then the model is something that a relationship is inferred from it. So it took data, say on high school GPA, university GPA. And so each one of these points is a student and the um, X axis represents their high school GPA and the Y axis represents their university GPA. So we got a bunch of students up there and we're not necessarily saying what's the cause of this. There could be a lot of those things, but we then do a regression line through it. And that line, the equation of that line is a model. The equation of that line is inferred from data, but it is a model. It answers the question, a what if question. What if someone were to get a 2.0 um, in, uh, in high school? What might we expect them on average to get in college? And, uh, and so there's no one who got a 2.0 in here. So it's answering that what if question. It's saying, well, we're predicting they would get around a 2.4 in college. Um, and so we could then go and test that, you know, that would make a prediction that we could then go and test. But so that red line is the model and that has been inferred from data. So we refer to that as a statistical model. Other types of models that we can have are just generally graphical models. So um, I love this graph here. So this is uh, communicating to me uh, an idea about human physiology or really vertebrate physiology in general, where with increasing exercise, your oxygen consumption increases, but you hit a point that we're gonna call your VO2 max, where increases in exercise intensity are not going to increase in oxygen consumption. And so if your body needs more energy, it's going to make use of anaerobic processes in order to get that, that energy. Um, and so that, um, is represented by this corner here. Now, what I love about this, this little diagram that they have up here is they put these little red dots here. So that's not data. They just embellished the line with the little red dots as if to say, what if you were to take data on someone? Well, that one individual's data as they increase in exercise intensity would be peppered around this line. So it's communicating to me what I would expect 
if I were to take an experiment at various exercise intensities, that's what the little dots are showing, while also communicating to me the general theory. Now, whether this theory is correct or not, it's not saying anything about that, but this at least now puts it out there and it makes a prediction so I could then go and do an experiment and then test this. And so this is not a model inferred from data. This is a model that was come up with from just physiology by reading the physiology books and then saying, under this model, we would expect this, go do an experiment and then test the experiment with this model with the experiment. Similarly, this is um, an output from a simulation model that's been graphed where the blue line represents a population, the number of rabbits in a simulated population. The green dashed line represents the population of wolves in a simulated population. And you get these cycles where whenever there are a lot of rabbits, you get a growth in wolves. But then once you get a lot of wolves, you get a decline in rabbits and this thing cycles. And so this is communicating an idea of a what if here, of if you had a two uh, species predator prey population here, what are the sorts of dynamics you might expect? And under that scenario, this is predicting that you might get these oscillations. And so now you could go out and test for those oscillations. So that's what I mean by a graphical model. It doesn't have to come from a simulation or math. It could just be scrawled on a board. It could just be drawn. And when it's drawn on a board, then you're communicating what you think would happen, that your model of what's happening there. You can have human models and organism models. We talked about the mouse model already. In the human model, we've got a woman here who's set up in this kind of respirometry setup here. And we don't know what's going on here, um, but she could be um, a participant in a study of all humans. She could be a participant in the study of human females, of white human females, of human females of a particular age. She could, or, you know, be at a doctor's office and be, um, be just you know, doing an assay of her own fitness to help her diagnose an issue that she's having. Even if she is the system of interest, we still refer to her as a model because the way things are going in the doctor's office is not necessarily the way things go in the rest of her life. And so we say, well, let's see how healthy your heart is. We're gonna put you in a stress test inside the doctor's office see how well you go. And based on your scores here, that will help us infer that when you're out in the world, when you're not in a doctor's office, when it's, you know, with the heat is fluctuating, when there's a stress of your everyday job, what's the likelihood that you're going to pass out in the middle of the day? So she can even be a model for herself because the conditions are never quite right. So, you know, it's, it's answering this, what if, what if you were stressed this way? That's what we're trying to answer here. So even humans can be models. And even traffic intersections can be models. So this is an image that I took of an intersection, I think in India, and uh, it has no uh, stoplights, just has these crosswalks, and everything kind of comes in. And when I look at this, to me, um, and if my pointer was working, I would swirl around the middle here. Um, and, uh, and it, there's sort of this self-organized traffic circle that just emerges out of everything coming together. And what's also interesting to me is I don't see any collisions. I see cars that are, um, there are people in between the cars, there are bikes, um, there are cars that are kind of moving around each other. It's not pretty, you know, this isn't like civil engineering 101 sort of stuff here, but it's working. It's maybe working slowly. It's working a lot better than I would have expected. Now, how generalizable is this result? I don't know, but this now has changed me. This has been a transitional object. Beforehand, if you told me with this much traffic density, if you didn't have a stoplight, I'd say it'd be total chaos and there would be crashes and deaths and all sorts of things like that. Now I see this and it makes me think, hmm, there's something about this situation where it works. It doesn't work necessarily the most efficiently, but it works in a way that I didn't expe ex expect. And so it changes my model, my mental model of how traffic intersections work when I look at this. So this is an example of doing, anytime you deploy anything in the wild, you're going to learn from it and it will change how you design the next thing that you're gonna deploy in the wild. And a great example of that, um, now again, how generalizable, you know, this, there might be something special about the culture of the people that live in this place that makes this work. Um, so 
that would be enough. You'd have to test this at a small scale. So go to the you know, you'd go to Singapore, go to Russia, go to the United States, and you know test this on one or two intersections at random spots, and then see how well it works there. And, uh, and you might find it, it works in some areas and doesn't in others. And then it would be interesting to say, well, why does it work in some areas and others? In, in others? But you know, but that you know, it's a model that we can then test in these different areas. Another great example of that is the Titanic. So people learned a lot from the Titanic. People think it just hit an iceberg, but you know, more recent research found that the metal that they used in the Titanic became extremely brittle at cold temperatures. So the iceberg that they hit wasn't actually that giant of a thing. It should be something that under normal temperature waters would not have caused the problems that it caused, but it just shattered it like an egg because they didn't understand the properties of this metal in that cold water. They learned a lot from that. So we look at this and we look at a tra tragedy and it is a tragedy, but every time a real piece of technology goes out there and has a result, we learn something from it. It is an experiment. The real world models, the real world systems out there are effectively, whether we like it or not, experiments that we are forcing on unwitting participants. So if I were to do an experiment here at this university, because we get federal funds, I would have to make sure that every person who was in that experiment gave their informed consent. And if I didn't, and the government found out about it, they could pull all of the federal funds from ASU. That's something that every one of us who works at a, at a university runs experiments with humans has to do. When you're out there in the real world, working for industry, not getting government money, you do not need to get informed consent. And in part, that's because every time you deploy a car, um, a new operational system or whatever, you are effectively running an experiment. Facebook, you know, is more explicit about it. They actually run formal experiments on people. Um, but even if you're not Facebook, if you're Ford or GM or whatever, you're still running experiments every time you deploy something. So, um, so these experiments are useful, but um, they're also can be catastrophic and it pays a huge cost. So what we're learning in this class is how to build artificial models that help us gain the same level of understanding without having to experiment in the real world. And for those who missed it in the question I asked, um, in the chat here, I see a couple of people, it looks like they've, they've it's already, oh, people echoed it, but yes, the answer in the chat here, I answered, what is the question that I use as a definition for models? What do models do? So this is what we're building simulation models for, is that to try to um, reduce how much experimentation we have to do in the real world. So we're gonna to try to build realistic models, more realistic than say these rate equations right here. So on the board here, there's some pretty simple, um, you know, this is almost like SIR math here. Um, these are mass balance equations and things. And, um, and in these, and these are very useful, but they, they lack some of the, the extra details, the extra realism. That's what we trickle in with simulation, but we don't necessarily have to go all the way. And so, um, something that we're going to learn is that reducing realism in models can actually increase generalizability. So not every ship is the Titanic. And so we can learn a lot about ships, but at some point, there's a limit to what we can generalize from the Titanic. If we built a model of a ship, we might try to maybe make it less specific to the, the cases of the Titanic to learn more fundamentals. And that's what we're going to see here is that we can reduce realism. So the, the kind of nice example I like to give here is the game of Monopoly. So Monopoly is a board game. It's been around since, I guess, 1935 is when this was filed. Um, it exists in lots of different forms now. You can play it on Android or an iOS as well. It still looks roughly the same wherever, wherever you play it. But the version they sell in London has London landmarks on it. The version they sell here has a lot of New York names and also some other names like railroads out in the West that made up things as well. But the interesting thing about Monopoly is it is a model of real estate transactions. And so it captures the sort of salient features of running a real estate empire in a real city, but it leaves out a lot of the details. And so in Monopoly, there's a jail, but no police officers. We don't need to worry about all the dynamics of maintaining a police force inside the game of Monopoly. 
But we do need to know that if we break the law, we're gonna go to jail. And so that we're gonna re reduce all of the details get to get rid of the running the police business and just add the salient feature of jails exist, don't break the law. And after playing Monopoly, we learn a little bit about real estate and then we might actually then, um, that changes maybe how we run our real estate empire. So, you know, I think, well, you know, nobody's gonna become a real estate tycoon after playing one game of Monopoly. But think about if you're a kid, you don't know anything about real estate, but if you can become a champion at Monopoly, you now know a lot more about real estate than you did. And when you go to college later, you probably can actually make use of some of those lessons. And so it's an example of you extract the important stuff, but not all the stuff, learn a few things, and then test what you learned. And you might find that some of the lessons you learned work in New York, but not in Los Angeles, not in Columbus. And then you might have to bleed in a little bit more details of Los Angeles, of Columbus, et cetera. But uh, there's still fundamentals that probably apply to both. And um, so, yeah, and that's the other thing that we can do here is these models help us actually share. So this monopoly board provides us a way to communicate real estate ideas to others that maybe are less um, easy to do um, when, we, when we're just talking to them. So models help us formalize ideas for communication so that we can share um, those ideas and get uh, feedback from others to help us enhance these models. So that's the other thing we're gonna see as you build your simulation models, say with your group, then you're gonna find out that, oh, you, you have an interesting view of how a coffee shop works. I have a slightly different view of how a coffee shop works. Let's try to incorporate both of those things into this model and it may enhance both of your views. Now, by formalizing it, it helps you um, better understand all the nuances of the differences between people. So models are a form of communication. But we just have to be careful that our assumptions are realistic. And this goes back to my, uh, my, my comments about degrees of freedom earlier. You have to make sure that your model isn't working so well just because of some assumptions you make. All right, so, um, so let's uh, so wrap up here. Um, so I want us to, to, um, to then step through um, what I mean by these mental models and why we then use quantitative models. And then on Thursday, we'll specifically introduce simulation. All right, so um, when you look at this, what do you see? Anybody have any, the first thing that comes to mind? Two triangles, that's, that's one. How many other people see two triangles? All right, so since they're, they're shared, what other things do you see? A star, how many other people see a star? Okay, I mean, there's this, maybe this five point there. Anything else people see? Yeah. Pac-Man, that's a common one I get in this. So, um, you know, maybe the, you know, these shapes here, Pac-Man. I once got somebody who said, uh, I see three Pac-Man um, attacking, like she had a whole narrative about um, like there was, some, there was like um, something inside here that was like a ghost that you couldn't see because it was a ghost. And these Pac-Men were all uh, teaming up on it. Like she had this like long thing that she all got out of this. Um, anything else? chat here, I see three Pac-Men. That's another yeah, great big comment from the chat. So yeah, the, the thing is, though, if you look at this though, none of that that you just said is actually in there, right? There's no actual triangle and these are broken lines, right? There's no star. Um, these, um, you know, Pac-Men, that's like the name of a character, right? So like, this is just splotches on a page, but our mind sort of forces us to answer these, you know, these what if questions. We have mental models in our head that are sort of saying, like trying to understand the causal, what happened? How was this made? And you could say, well, what if somebody laid a triangle down on top of another triangle and there actually were three circles on it and then maybe it would end up having this sort of, um, this sort of view with the white triangle on top of this or whatever. So in your head, you have a mental model that allows you to then try out different what if questions. And so these mental models are helping to fill that stuff in. Likewise, when you look at this, what do you, um, you know, if I were to guess here, um, I mean, people, um, I mean, are there any, you know, what, does anybody have a, a comment on what they see here? What, what do you think's going on here? When you look at this image? 
and you're a guy about to fall through a hole. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's one, it's probably a common one here. Um, anybody else, any other comments about this guy or in the chat, it's fine too. All right, so what's, what's the shape of the hole? Circle, everybody says circle. And that's interesting to me because if you look at it, you know, on the screen, it's not a circle, right? You know, it's an oval that's on the screen here. But we all think that it's a circle because we have a mental model that is, uh, you know, looking at a particular perspective that if he was standing on a circle, it would end up looking like an oval to us from this perspective. Now, it may not be perfectly circular, but we're just assuming that it's gotta be a circle because why else would it not be a circle? It seems like if you're gonna cut a hole, you might as well cut a circular hole. There's all sorts of mental garbage and baggage that are going on in our head that we are going to impose on this diagram here. There's, you know, a lot of people say, well, this is a saw blade maybe, like a hacksaw blade or something. But, you know, it's, it's just a bunch of squiggled lines. Like there's, there's a, a story here. You might even make an inference about uh, whether you like the guy or not. I mean, I've heard people that say, um, I've had students say that this is a, um, a snotty individual who's about to get what he deserves. Like, what did he ever do to you, this poor cartoon character? But somehow, when you look at this, you might have a visceral reaction and you might agree with whatever the setting is going on here. So there are mental models here that if we can help to, to understand and formalize, it will help us and build you know, our models. So I'm trying to make you think like when you go into a bank, your head thinks about how a bank works and we need to identify what you're in, um, assuming is always gonna go on before you build that quantitative model. Similarly, I look at this. This is sort of a famous uh, painting, I think, in the Louvre, that um, where up top here, this says tandem convergent. It's a model for fiancés. Tandem divergent at the bottom. It's a model for couples just before divorce. Um, if you can't see um, here, these are two bicycles pointed towards each other, sharing the same front wheel. Here, these are two bicycles pointed away from each other, sharing a back wheel. You look at this and you don't have to build these bicycles to know that neither of them are going to work. And I think you get what's being trying to be communicated here. Here, you're with someone who you want nothing more to be closer to. And no matter how hard you try, this is the closest you're gonna be able to get. Here, it's the opposite, where you want nothing more to be away from someone. And no matter how hard you try, you can't get away from them. And so, I mean, this is communicating ideas that have nothing to do with mechanics. And you didn't have to build the bicycle to know what's being communicated. So they're using mechanics to communicate an idea that has nothing to do with mechanics. You don't even have to build the thing to understand what they're communicating. Now, people have built that because they thought it was cute to do so. So you can find this one in a museum as well. Um, but you don't have to build them because your mental models know how a bicycle works. Similarly, if I were to show you a picture of a boat, your mental model might know how to steer that boat. Now, the first time you ever got into a boat like that and tried to steer it, you might have done, if you've ever seen Independence Day with Will Smith, there's a scene where he gets into an alien spaceship and they have uh, put the labels of which direction is forward, uh, backwards, and he ends up trying to drive forward, ends up running the ship backwards until he has to update his mental model. Same sort of thing here. You go into a boat like this, you might want to steer left, and so thinking about a steering wheel, you might turn the rudder to the left and then you'll see that the boat goes the wrong direction. You update your mental model and then you start driving correctly. So, um, so here you've got mental models that are constantly being changed by your experience. So these mental models help us use the world and the world helps us update our mental models. This example that I like to give, and this is a sort of a famous example, they've written papers on this, where a man and his son, this is a scenario, a man and his son are driving a car one day and they get into a fatal accident. The man is killed instantly. The boy is knocked unconscious, but he is still alive. He's rushed to the hospital and will need immediate surgery. The doctor enters the emergency room, looks at him and says, I can't operate on this boy, he is my son. Now, older audiences are really puzzled by this passage. They just don't get how it could be possible. Younger audiences, not so much. So what's going on here? Is there a puzzle here or is there not a puzzle? What's the scenario? 
tell me something about the doctor or the son or anything here. Yeah, go ahead. The doctor's a mom. Easy, right? That's an easy resolution to this. Anything else could possibly be going on here? Yeah. I mean, it could just be like a family friend or something completely unrelated to the boy. Um, well, he says a man and his son. Ah. Yeah. Are there any other uh, resolutions to whatever puzzle might be here about the doctor, for example? Doctor could be gay, for example. Could be another another man. You know, so there uh, initially when this example was cooked up, um, then this is a test to show that like people who grew up say in the 70s and the 60s, their mental models of professionals were, um, they had a heteronormative model of people who raise children and they had a professional model of doctors that implied that only men could be doctors. Younger audiences often don't see much of a puzzle here um, and so they say, yeah, well, of course, the doctor is his mom. What's the big, big deal? Why are you putting this up there? What sort of idiot are you? And, and it's this, um, this, this contrast between these that shows us how interesting our mental models um, change the way we view the world. And so all models are wrong, but some are useful. And you have to ask yourself, how useful was your mental model here? You know, this is a very realistic situation that could happen, especially in today's you know, professional climate. This is definitely something that's not, I mean, it, it, could, it could definitely happen, but do you have a mental model that helps you make sense of this? And older audiences did not, younger audiences tend to. So mental models, their major strength is they're a, tr a tremendous store of information. And so a mental model is built up over your entire lifetime. You're just building up all of these experiences, adding them together, learning how to drive boats, drive cars, work at banks, all of these things that you add together. And that's why we have domain experts, because ultimately, you know, we may not know everything about this particular manufacturing process, but we have a domain expert who may not know anything about modeling, um, you know, formal modeling, but they know all of these details about when you run this at this temperature, when you do it with this particular material, and we ask them all these questions because we're going to pull that out of their heads. The trouble with mental models is that when things get complex or dynamic, mental models are not that great at it. When you throw in lots of different components together, or you talk about things changing over time, the mental models are not um, necessarily make the best predictions. And they're also difficult to communicate to someone else. You know, you can say, oh, so I thought all of the important things I need to make this particular uh, widget were, you know, were these components. And then you say, oh, well, you know, I forgot to tell you, you also need these other components and you need to do them in this particular order. And, you know, so it's, you all, it's sometimes it's difficult to communicate all of these things. And that's one of the advantages where formalizing that can help. And so that's why once we identify our mental models, we then move toward building formal quantitative models. So a quantitative model like this one on the board, which is very similar to this SIR model, which is a epidemiological model, which is very relevant now, I guess, um, uh, on, on here. They are much better at handling complexity and dynamic change. They're easier to communicate to others because all everything is right there up on the board if you know how to read it, uh, but they incorporate very little information. So these do not benefit from the, you know, the lifetime of experience. And so that's the, the downside of quantitative models. So there are different types of quantitative models, like in 470, the focus is on analytical models, mathematical models, like the one on the board, the one on, on uh, the slide here. And, um, and the idea here is that they can provide exact solutions. You can get a formula out of them and that's, that's a plus. The downside, they can be difficult to solve or their solutions are only valid within a very limited context. Like they only exist out at time equal infinity. You don't actually know what's gonna go on kind of in the middle. So, so that's maybe a downside. You can then go to a different type of quantitative model, which we call a numerical model, where instead of solving things mathematically, you can put them into like a spreadsheet and you can solve them um, because these are dynamic models um, for every instant of time. And you can then watch the system evolve over time. You don't get a formula out, but you get these graphs out of how things apply over time. 
these can be good communication tools. They can help you gain insights into what happens before your system runs to infinity. The downside is they don't have a lot of flexibility because you have to rebuild the spreadsheet whenever you make a, a system change um, and the solutions are approximate. So the models that we're going to be working with this, um, this semester are simulation models. So these are models that um, we don't worry about building all, we, we use small scale math to describe tiny little bits of the system. And then we link all those system bits together and allow the computer to do that intersection for us. And so um, these are still very approximate like the numerical models, but um, they're very flexible because we can rewire things together and the computer will be doing all of the mathematical housekeeping for us. And so this is looking a little abstract right now, but like this SIR model, this up here is the simulation version of that same mathematical expression, that epidemiological model I showed you before. I'm not gonna go into the details here, um, but the idea here is instead of writing three equations, I can draw things and connect them together and the computer will behind the scenes form any math that I might need and do all that for me. So um, the downside of this, again, it's approximate and the outcome may depend a lot on the choices the computer is making for me that I would otherwise be making if I did one of those other two. So you use um, simulation models. Um, there's some great examples of simulation modeling being used at say Southwest Airlines for um, you know, the way we load on planes was informed by simulation model. Back when I started flying, everybody loaded back to front. Southwest ran an agent-based model showing that you could run all sorts of different types of boarding. And in the end, because of the randomness of how people sat in their seats, you didn't actually load the planes any faster, regardless if you did back to front, front to back, random or whatever. So they said, instead, let's just allow people to seat themselves and we will then monetize the boarding order. So you can pay to board first and they get a little bit more extra money out of it and their operations don't suffer. So that came from a simulation. They did a similar sort of thing with cargo that I don't wanna go into because I'm running out of time here, but they've used a lot of this kind of simulation modeling um, to, opera, to um, optimize operations in Southwest. Um, this is an example here that's uh, very relevant now, um, disease spread on a plane. So this is an example from some ASU people from several years ago where they studied how different boarding orders change how rapidly disease spreads in a cabin. So that's something that would be very difficult to model with a formula like those on the, the board there, but running a sim gives you these beautiful graphs that allow you to run an experiment to compare different seating orders. And that's what they've done right here. So we're running experiments on simulated models because it'd be too costly to do that in the real world. So that's what we're doing this semester. We're combining math, stats and programming all together. It's more than just programming. This isn't just an arena class. Um, our main challenges here are to build useful, insightful models that run fast on computers. And we're gonna need good stats to do both of these things. So we jam all of that into 475. Um, so if any of this um, is of interest to you, then you can break these things apart. And they're like grad level classes they go into the math of simulation, they go into the stats of simulation, they go into more of the programming of simulation. This is sort of a survey of the basics of putting those all together of the math, stats, and programming you need to do effective simulation. So, all right, um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll just ask for questions. Here, I'll just put these reminders up here. So again, lab one is assigned this week, it's due Sunday, ICA, um, a2 is due on Thursday. It's just a two question ICA, make sure to do that. And if you wanna work ahead, the next two homeworks, all the ICAs and all the labs are available. So um, let me uh, put this last attendance exercise up and then I'll ask for any closing questions. The attendance exercise here is, um, what is the strength of mental models? So put this under question two in your form and then you can hit submit. So what are the, what's the pros of mental modeling? And that's it. So those two questions are all we had for today. Hit submit and that's your attendance obligation for today. And for those of you at home or going home, um, you've got 24 hours from after I post this video that you'll be able to submit those as well. All right, so any questions or is that pretty clear? 
All right, so real philosophical today. We're starting to, we'll start getting more concrete on Thursday. So um, uh, simulation on Thursday. I'm checking the chat for questions. So any questions from the chat, feel free to put, or from online, feel free to put them in the chat. Otherwise, that's all I've got for everybody. All right.